Mm-hmm. I'm David Sachs, and I'm panicked about the mob that's formed to take away our news feed. Nut. Yes, Howard. Keynute. What's up? We have a special guest. Yes, we do. You know, I was manscaping the other day and I uh, nicked myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you couldn't have nicked yourself. I nicked my sack. Speaking of sacks, we have that's... David Sacks. It's a tough get. I haven't met him, but uh, he, I think he follows him. But maybe he's, he's a part of some algo. <laughs> We're going to talk about the, he's panicked about the, the feed. He's panicked about the mob, this David Sachs, a piece of work. He's funny guy. I didn't know he was funny until I heard his voice. Before, I just thought he was just a bit grumpy and mean and <laughs> uh, unapproachable. But once I heard his podcast shtick, I became a fan of the talent that is David Sachs. So David Sachs, let me, I don't want to bore people because he does a lot of media in If they want to learn more, it's so easy to find out about him. I want to talk about the future and what he's doing now and what's aggravating him because there's a lot of stuff aggravating him and better him to complain than me because we kind of complain about the same things. He just has a a bigger pulpit. He's been in the technology industry forever. I think he was born on a chip and um, he got involved early. I think he was in the founding COO of PayPal. Have you heard of PayPal? I think I have. I think I have to use them about an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think it was their it was multi-billion dollar, ex- obviously today, I don't know, $300 billion company. So founding COO there, uh, last 15 to 20 years, he's struggled. Okay, like, really poor guy. Uh, awful. Let's see, a firm, Airbnb, Bird, ClickUp. I'm seeing the red there. I got to talk about that. Facebook. House, Lyft, Open Door. Oh, Canute, this would be a good guy to ask for a loan. <laughs> Palantir, Postmates, Reddit, Slack, SpaceX, Twitter. Fucking guy, Uber, blah, blah, blah. So, I don't know, why does he have time to talk to me? He's also co-founder. I'm friends with a lot of people at his firm. He's co-founder and general partner at Craft Ventures. We have not done a deal together ever, or nor uh, does he return my calls. I don't even think he knows who I am and what this podcast is. He just found an hour in his schedule. He, I've done uh, one deal with someone in his firm, Lacey, on uh, Koifen, and Brian Rosenblatt, who works at Kraft's partner. We chat all the time. I think it's now a $2 billion fund. Whoa. Hee-haw. Amazing. And then, you know, because he's upset about uh, a feature or the product that was, uh, and I agree with him because I don't use it. Um, the hell's the name? I don't even remember the damn name. Of it, but audio, uh, we'll talk about audio because he has an app called Call-In. And I've tested it. It's cool. So hopefully he invites me on to Call-In. So should we get David on the phone? I think we should. So anyway, so that's his background, all right? So we want to talk about a little bit of that, but more about the future. So uh, let's get David on the phone. David Sachs. Howard, all I can say is like Manscaped better be a sponsor of your pod. I was a seed investor, so we're just pimping my own. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I was wondering about that intro. <laughs> the intro is just, you know, I'm a pimp. What can I say? I'm like yeah. a baby chamath. I would say. So do you, you like podcasting? I mean, you have a voice for it. You have a really good voice. Do, have you always had that kind of voice? You know, I don't think I'm a natural podcaster. I'm, you know, J Cal is, is the podcaster in our group. And if it weren't for, you know, him and Chamas setting up this all in pod, I never would have done it. But, you know, me and Freeberg were early guests on that show. We were the first two guests and it sort of worked as a foursome. And then it just kind of clicked and we stuck with it. So, but I don't, I don't really see myself other than doing that pod. I don't really see myself as a podcast personality. I'd rather own the platform, which is what we're trying to do with, with Colin. <laughs> yeah. Cause you haven't had any success. So, so talk to me about Colin. Cause you, you don't need the aggravation. Um, you got kids. I don't even want to get into the personal stuff, but you got kids, you got a wife, you got headaches. Um, and you like me. I mean, how old are you in your forties? Yeah, I'm 49. Okay, so you're 49, I'm 56. You, I hear them joke about your weight, but it seems like you got a little bit under control. 
yeah, I've lost like 25 pounds since they started giving me such a hard time about it. So that was definitely motivation. Now J. Cal is back to being the fattest guy in the group. <laughs> well, that's good news. So there's some good news out of this. The, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so how heavy were you, man? Like what, what was going on? I, well, it was like all COVID weight, you know, um, I think I was like pushing 200. I think I was in the high 190s. That's not horrible. How tall are you? 5'3"? <laughs> I'm like 5'9". Five, five, so, I mean, That's it was... a little was, heavy it, for 5'9". It, it was definitely heavy. So, I pre-COVID, I was like, you know, I, I'm where I was back then, which is more like 172. So, it was, you know, I've been on a severe calorie restriction diet since about May. And it's been working. God, it's so hard. I got to say, we're already off topic, but fuck the topics. As someone who's 56 and just rides around the world on a bike just so I can drink milkshakes and eat carbs, I don't think I could do. I, I just did seven days in the Alps with people, and that was easier than me going calorie light. So how do you, is it just mental? It's a, it's a lot of it is mental. Um, what I would say is, well, everyone's looking for tricks. I don't believe there's that's that. Right, exactly. So the, the bottom line is that if you want to lose weight, fewer calories have to go in Correct. than you burn and come out. That's it. And everyone's looking for some way to avoid that reality by trying to, you know, trick their body by going into ketosis or, you know, doing intermittent fasting or whatever. And the reality is you just have to limit the amount of calories. So you know, obviously you do stuff like just no carbs. So it is keto like, but the, the, the thing that I do that's a little different is uh, try to be as plant-based as possible. So it's not that you can't have meat, but there's a pecking order. First you eat plants, then you eat fish, then you eat like poultry, then you get to red meat and you just try to eat less calorie dense food. Hmm. Not going to work for me. I'm going to just stick to fucking riding the Alps. I, I, I wake up with meat. I have a steak in the morning. I have a lot of fake tea, so meat gets stuck in my teeth, and that's kind of my late night snack. Is that normal? Is that somebody you could do business with? <laughs> the uh, what is a pet peeve of Dave's? Just fucking kills something right off the bat. Like you take a meeting, and and it's just a pet peeve. Do you have them? I don't. I don't have huge pet peeves. Um, I'll tell you. I did a board meeting last week where they blew past all their numbers, and we ended half an hour early, and it was only a two hour meeting to begin with. So that was delightful. That was about the best board meeting I've ever had. So I guess my pet peeve now is just long meetings. I mean, I'm just like, I want to try and do everything as quickly as possible. I feel like every pitch should be half an hour and every board meeting should be an hour and that's it. All right. I'm with you there. So call it, I know from listening that uh, it was a pet peeve. Like you, I, I mm -hmm. still, this audio space has is, is been tried so many times. You know, Twitter started out as an audio product. You know, um, what is it that dragged you back in? Well, what we're doing with Colin, it's sort of a, a synthesis of podcasting and social audio. We call it social podcasting. Mm -hmm. So anyone can just create a show in the app. And then to create an episode, you just create a room and it's like recording a pod in front of a live studio audience. It's like, a social audio experience, but the creator is really in control and they can bring people from the audience up one at a time to ask questions. Uh, but it's not, it's not like a many to many conversation. And then every, every room is automatically recorded. And then there's a post-production or editing facility in the app where you can go in and you can edit a transcript to edit the episode. And then you can just publish it as an episode of your show. And then, you know, it gets distributed out from there. So it's, um, yeah, you know, again, so it's it's fusing this concept of social audio with podcasting. And who is the target? Like, is it more casual? Or are you going after pros? Like, what's the idea? I think it's going to be a range. I mean, it's very much a long tail strategy. You know, in the same way that YouTube allowed anyone to create a video channel, we want to allow anyone to create, you know, a, a show or an audio channel pod. Um, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of tools right now for podcasters, but you got to go out and get like, you know, specialized hardware and then you're using specialized software and then you have to do the post-production. I mean, the thing that I learned from doing the all in pod is there's at least a six hour delay after we tape every episode where we have a post-production guy in the studio, like putting all the sound files together, uh, along with the, the zoom. And it's just kind of crazy. So yeah. just automating all of that in a way where you can just create a room and then 
edit it yourself and just press publish. So I think we're making it exponentially easier. Um, like you guys, I mean, what's the delay between when we're taping now and when this will be published? I mean, for us, it's because we're only putting out one a week. And so we try and make it not time relevant. But what, what is it? Can it- Just a lot of editing and, and audio fixing and that stuff like that to make it sound as good as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. I think, I think there are podcasters who like to do the whole studio experience. But our thesis on it is there's a lot of value in just being able to push a button and go live, start talking. You've seen that, I think, really delight people on social audio sites. But all those sites are sort of ephemeral. And then you have this problem of the conversations are, it's kind of like a party line. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's in there fighting for the microphone. You don't really have a host who's in control. And so we're, we're fixing those problems. And so you like fixing problems. Um, what was your tech moment as a kid? Were you, was it a tech household? Was it, uh, are you a geek? What was the first aha moment? Like, this is my life. Probably joining PayPal. I mean, as a kid, I was into computers and I had one of the early Apples. I had like, you know, a Mac Plus or whatever. And I did know how to write basic. And, you know, so I, I, was, I was sort of into it, um, but not like as a total preoccupation. And then I graduated Stanford in 1994. And then the internet hadn't quite taken off yet. And so I ended up going to law school because that was just kind of the default path for People who are good at school didn't really know what they wanted to do. So I was in law school and the internet just started taking off in a big way. And I was like, gee, you know, it's too bad I, I missed it because I, I knew people at Stanford who graduated one year later in, in, in 1995. And they, they got sucked into this really exciting thing that, you know, you had Netscape, I think IPO would in 95 and then you had Yahoo and eBay and Amazon. All these, was this like, Stanford like, law school or a different one? No, this was, this was Stanford undergrad. Okay. Stanford undergrad. Sorry. So then yeah. you go to law school. So, and then, oh, sorry. So Stanford undergrad, I graduated in 94. And then I go to University of Chicago Law School from ah. 95 to 98. And so I think I've just missed this whole thing. <laughs> I'm like, it's bummer. Like, I wish I graduated a year later. <laughs> you missed it. Well, that's, that's what I felt. And then I got a, in 1999. I, so I graduated from law school, was working at McKinsey <laughs> as a consultant. Oh, yeah. And, dodged a bullet. But, but that, yeah, but I mean, that was what people did. It wanted yeah. to get into business. We yeah. didn't know what else to do. Yep. So I get a call from Peter and he describes what he's doing. And uh, well, so you, you know, knew I'd Peter gone, from school, from undergrad? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I, he was, he was in law school at Stanford while I was an undergrad there. And um, I knew him because he had founded the Stanford Review. I had written for the review. I was an editor. Uh, we'd actually done a book together that was sort of based on our college journalism. And so he called me up and, and, uh, you know, told me about what he was doing. The company was called Confinity then, and he recruited me. And did he call you Saxy Poo, or just did, did he call you D Sack? <laughs> Do you guys have pet um, names? Was, Do you guys have a no. nickname for Peter Toe? Is he PT? Um, no. You know, P- Peter's not like a guy who you have like a bestie nickname for. God, he's, just, he's uh, all business Peter. all the time. He's just Peter. Yeah, pretty much. But you go with the flow. I didn't know that. Like you, you can be. You have a sense of humor about all this. Uh, yeah, kind of, I guess so. And so, so he, he, he mentions PayPal, you had no idea is FinTech or whatever. You just like, I'm in. Well, it, 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 there's a little more involved than that. Um, we had conversations about what he was doing back then. It was this Palm pilot beaming thing. You could beam money from one Palm pilot to another. Not many people remember what the Palm pilot was. Love it was like the, my, I, didn't, yeah, I thought you'd have yeah. to pry it out of my dead hands. <laughs> that and uh, what did I use for uh, the first um, SAS? The first oh, I can't remember. Act, Act Act was such a great contact management software back in the day. It synced with my Palm Pilot. Fuck, I'm dating myself. Do you remember Act? I don't. I don't. Remember. Yeah, I mean, well, I sort of remember there was like a contact thing on on the Palm Pilot, and you could beam the the big innovation. The the thing they thought that was going to take them to wherever they were going was this like infrared port. Yeah on the palm and you could beam stuff from one palm pilot to another. So you could yeah. beam your business card, or your contact or whatever. Yeah. And so we, we, uh, so PayPal had created the, the palm beaming. You could beam money from one palm pilot to another. Mm-hmm. And the conversation I had with Peter was why would anyone want to do that? It seems kind of like a dumb idea, <laughs> but what if you could email money instead, that would be a killer idea. And, um, and there was sort of this edge case feature where they had built a website to support the palm product and, um, in any event, I, I joined the company to focus on the, the emailing money idea and we renamed the, the, the company after the product and it kind of took off from there. 
What an amazing story. So, so yep. they talk about the PayPal mafia, but really what is it? Like when did it first, I know there was a picture of you lunatics in some magazine, mm-hmm. but like, was it something that you knew that you were part of uh, something great? Like, did you know Musk was great? Like you just knew it? Yeah. I mean, it, it was a little bit of, of both knowing it, but not knowing. It. So I guess what I thought at the time is that these are the smartest people I knew. So you knew that, like you talk to him, you go, oh, fuck. Right. Like I knew like people like Peter and Elon and Max and these other folks, these are the smartest people who I've met or who I know, but I didn't know that they were the smartest people that like anyone knew. Right. You know, cause I, I didn't, I didn't know enough people in the world. I didn't know that, okay, this is pretty much like as good as it gets, right, you know? Right. And it, so it took, it took, you know, more decades and context to understand that. Fascinating. So you didn't know, but you knew they were smart. It was the original network before the network. It just yeah. all happened to be at the same company. And so. Yeah. And, and Elon was, you know, super, I, I thought Elon was super charismatic even back then. You know, he had already had a successful company before x.com it was called zip2 he had sold it and made i don't know like tens of millions of dollars you know at the time you know that that made him like a god um to me because he had already done this mm-hmm. and um and so yeah i mean now and then we you know what, what happened is that you had sort of the peter and max side which was paypal and then you had elon had his company x.com and the two ended up merging and what do you think it is that you've been around that many people in one room, let's say at one time in their prime, and maybe the prime now is, is with your ability to lose weight and all of our ability to like mind over matter and, and kind of get shit done. What was it about that era, do you think? It was just right place, right time? Or is it Peter's ability to recruit or, or, or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like what was in the water at PayPal yeah. that attracted all these great people, I think there's a few things going on. So, so one is, yeah, the people themselves were not recruited through headhunters. They were recruited through a friendship network. Mm-hmm. And so Peter recruited me because we had gone to school together and Max recruited engineers he knew from U of I and so on down the line. And so like everybody was sort of cut from the same cloth in the sense that like very disruptive, contrarian sort of founder personality types. They're going to recruit people like them. They're not going to recruit like, you know, very corporate mindset type people. Um, so, so the first of all, you had kind of this very entrepreneurial DNA. You also had the timing of it, which wasn't just the dot-com boom in 99. You got to remember that like PayPal survived the crash. The crash happened in 2000. We were the first dot-com to IPO after the dot-com crash in early 2002. And then the company got acquired by eBay later in 2002. And so you had this timing where we were one of the few successful outcomes, you know, post.com crash. And that was a time when everyone just left. Everyone was leaving Silicon Valley. I mean, the joke back in the early 2000s was that B2B meant back to banking and B2C meant back to consulting. I mean, everybody was leaving. <laughs> I didn't so, hear that. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you had this group of people who, while everybody else was dispirited and leaving, had just had a success but they hadn't made so much money that they were ready just to like yeah. retire. Uh-huh. And then, and then of course, eBay made no effort whatsoever to retain any of the key people. They, you know, there wow. was like, yeah, there was a huge culture mismatch where yeah. eBay was an extremely corporate uh, culture. And they kind of looked with disdain at all these like, you know, very entrepreneurial types who they thought were kind of weird and they were quite happy for them to all leave. And so they did. So you had this like exodus, of very entrepreneurial talent. And then I guess the last piece of it is we learned a lot of playbooks from PayPal about how you go viral, how you bootstrap a company. I mean, this was at a time before blogging, right? It was before YC. It wasn't clear how you did any of this stuff. There's no playbook. It was there were no playbooks. There's no viral mechanics either. Right. I didn't know how to get into entrepreneurship. Again, if it wasn't for that phone call from Peter, I probably would be a, you know, consultant somewhere. So, you know, some someone doing something very tracked. Yeah. So you had this group of like very entrepreneurial people who were coming off big success, who were, were not demoralized. In fact, they wanted to do new things and then they had the playbooks to do them. And we kind of had the feel to ourselves. And so that's what allowed us to, I, you know, I think it's been overstated. I wouldn't say we reshaped Silicon Valley, but it allowed this group of people to have this outsized influence on Silicon Valley. True. Cause if you stay, I, I was going to ask next, if you stay, you, you don't know what, yeah, I mean, you build something great, but maybe you don't go off and do all these other companies and come back and, and multiply and do all these things. Was it consensus that you should sell? You know, um, 
uh, I remember Elon didn't want to sell. Mm -hmm. I would say Elon was like the one person who said, no, don't sell. You know, we'll figure this out. The company will be a lot bigger. Um, I would say that the team though was pretty exhausted. They were run down and, um, there, there were just a lot of like battles that they've been fighting for years. And, um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I think Elon probably deserves credit for, for seeing that PayPal would one day be a hundred billion dollar plus company. He always said that. And, um, so no, he didn't want us to sell. Although I think he would acknowledge that selling was a good thing in the sense that it gave him the resources to go do Tesla and SpaceX. That's what I'm saying. Like you can't go do, you know. I hear people, you know, on stock Twitter and Twitter or just wherever they're chatting about stocks. It's like, oh, and I wanted to talk to you about it because you, you know, like I know, it's just like selling early is just part of the game. It's life. Like, you, you know, you all could have held the stock. You know what I mean? Like there's trade-offs. You move on, you, you, right. you, you clean up, you pick up, you leave money on the table. Like, how do you think about that? Because it's like, oh, everybody's like, I shouldn't have sold. How do you move on from that type of stuff? Well, I sort of made this mistake twice because we, you know, when we got a unicorn offer for Yammer, I made the decision to sell again. I, you, you know, it's, it's hard for a sane person to turn down those kinds of offers, right? Because it gives you all the capital you need to, you know, not only have security, but to do anything else you want to do in your life. And so I think it's, it's hard to turn those decisions down. Um, that being said, I do think that the entrepreneurs who have achieved the greatest success do turn down those offers because it's usually the case that if you're going to create, say, a $100 billion company or $50 billion company or a trillion dollar company or whatever, there's going to be acquisition offers along the way. And if you want to get to that level, you have to turn them down, which is why there is an element of craziness among, you know, any, any founder who's created, you know, a multi hundred billion dollar company, there is usually an element of craziness that the same thing to do would be to sell. And they, they always turn that down. And do you own Tesla shares today? I do, yeah. Yeah, I'm an idiot. The And I think the biggest <laughs> mistake for me, and I tell people, is my big mistake with Tesla is just not buying the product. You know, Gary, my partner, and Alex Bard, they played with that product. And if you own the product, you own the stock. So, the, you know, the, you got to play with these products. I think, I think my two favorite companies, CEOs, and it always changes, right? There's great companies out there, but you know, Phil Knight building Nike and Reed Hastings now, I, I hate not including Bezos or certain people, but like Reed Hastings with Netflix and seeing what it's doing post COVID and, and just the power of that platform. That's just, like you said, like there's so many times they could have exited along the way. And right. these founder led companies that keep going are just special. Like it's hard to own non founder led companies. It's hard for these things to be right. great. And so when right. you're sizing up a founder at the beginning, how, cause you love investing. So how does that play into how you think about things? Well, it's a, it's a factor for sure. I mean, you want to, you want to think about, you know, what the, you look at the founder's vision and um, how ambitious they are and how smart they are and, you know, how articulate they are and, and all that, those kinds of things. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is just that a lot of these founders start off very young and they don't, look the way they're going to look. They don't sound the way they're going to sound 10 years later. Correct. Um, so it's, if you're just trying to index on like how impressive the person seems in the room today, I think it's like actually a pretty hard thing to gauge because what's going to happen is in the process of them creating a big company, they're going to level up so many times. And, um, and you know, there, there, there are graders of talent who I think are good at spotting those types of people that's not, I mean, and, and look, I mean, it's, it's, it's a factor, but it's not like the main thing I invest in actually, or on actually. If you take away the product, cause you're a product guy, it, what's the number one thing I, for, for me, it's recruiting. I wasn't good at it. No one told me how important it was. What are the things that you tell fan? Cause you've been through the, the machine so many times. I know you, and, and again, I'll point to people to the stuff that you write. I don't want to regurgitate it here online, but so I'm just trying to use my time with you to just, pick your brain is um, because the essays are there and people should go read them and I'll I'll point to them. But you know, when I was starting out and everybody was throwing money at me because I had an exit, so I knew what I was doing or I knew my domain. No one told me what it was going to be like to run a company. They didn't really ask me, are you that type of founder? So what are the things that, you know, doing Yammer and seeing PayPal and watching all these companies do it, you know, obviously you got to have product market fit, but after that, what is the most important thing for a founder? 
I think it's probably well, you know, after just building the product, like you said, that I mean, in in the beginning that stage, this has, this has to yeah, it has to be a product manager. There's every founder now has to be a product founder. Uh, Correct. But after that, I would say it's distribution. Uh, that that's the most important thing to figure out, and and ideally, the distribution is baked into the product somehow. Um, I mean, look, it, that that is part of the product market fit. You can't really do it without distribution, but. Being able to innovate around distribution and build the distribution machine, whatever it is, is really critical. Yep. And in order to do that, you absolutely have to be able to do things like recruit, no question about it. Um, you have to be able to sell people on your vision, what you're trying to do. You got to be able to raise money. I mean, all those kinds of things. And so craft ventures. So you, you do PayPal, you, you get out of the game you go start Yammer eventually. And we can come back to that. Um, what's the idea for Craft Ventures start? Because that's what you're doing today. So where did yeah. that come from? Well, I've been angel investing for 20 years and had something like 25 unicorns. And mm-hmm. just around 2017, decided to institutionalize it a little bit by taking LP money and scaling that up. Basically, I decided that I didn't want to be a sort of day-to-day operator anymore. I mean, that was sort of the decision I made. And so that freed up a lot of time to potentially scale my investing. And um, so Craft started as a way to to do that. I think Craft One was, the first fund was 350 million. And um, then we, you know, now we're on Craft Three right now. Uh, like you said, at the beginning, we have about 2 billion under management. The current funds are 1.1 billion um, 600 for early stage, 500 million for late stage. Um, and it's, it's a pretty classic venture strategy. Um, although in terms of, you know, working with founders, um, you know, at, at, at early stages, we do C, series A, series B, um, and then the, the growth fund does some series C as well. Um, and, um, I mean, it's, it's sort of classic, you know, venture. We do tend to focus on two areas though. One is SaaS, specifically bottom up SaaS. Yep. And the other is marketplaces. So we have developed a more of a vertical focus on those two areas. Yeah, those are the two areas, and, and, and we'll get to those. So in, in today, everything, you've been through the crash. You, you've done startups, and you've sold them. You've been around great people. What are people not seeing today? I know you don't shy away from a good argument. Obviously, we're bullish. We, we're not timing the market. But like, how does this, you know, in 99 you were young, so you, you, you weren't paid to see it coming. And maybe you're not paid to see it coming, but now that you're managing $2 billion, I mean, you have to have a point of view here. What, what is in the machine that scares you? Well, first of all, I mean, the, the startup environment has never been better. Correct. I mean, it's, never been, it's just never been better. It's never been frothier. It's never been easier for a founder to raise money. Um, to, to, to do anything except, I guess, recruit talent. I mean, that's the one thing that's hardest because – all the easy funding means that anybody can found a company now. And then so the, the level of the competition now is at the, uh, the, the, the recruiting level. Um, but I mean, it, it just times have never been better. I mean, they've also never been better for investors who, I mean, we're minting something like a that we're on pace to mint a thousand unicorns this year or something like that. I mean, mm-hmm. at the end of last year, it was something like a pace of one unicorn a day was being created. Now we're at like three. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's sort of like pinch me. I mean, everything's going great. I mean, if you look at our portfolio, so fund one is like vintage 2017, 2018. We did a lot of crypto in there. We have a lot of SpaceX in there and some other, and, um, we're, we're about to, we're the series A investor in Burr, which is about to SPAC. And then we also have some really interesting SaaS companies. I mean, that fund looks like it's going to be at least like a five X. Mm-hmm. Um, and then fund two which is uh, was 2019 and 2020. So we just stopped investing that last year. Um, I mean, th- that fund was the beginning of really our vertical focus on SaaS and marketplaces. I think we're going to have like 10 unicorns in that fund. We already have three it, just within two years. And we're talking about companies where we led the Series A or, or like a very early round. And then there's like six or seven that are in that like pre-unicorn stage of you know, 600, 600 to eight hundred million dollar valuations, and they feel like they're going to all be unicorns in the next six to twelve months. So it's just like a little bit bonkers, um, just how good everything is right now. And so that's the way I see it. So I'm talking to you, and you're talking to me, and we're all talking to our founders, and we're seeing this. So what are we missing, or is it just the network effects in play? 
and you just run like hell and don't worry about it? Well, I think founders should, I mean, to use a Bill Gurley expression, should play the, the game that's on the field, which is, like you said, I think you, you raise money at high valuations and you, you just go for it. Um, I think you have to be a little bit careful to always have enough cushion to withstand the sudden collapse. I think the thing that founders don't understand if they haven't experienced is that when a correction happens, it is like overnight. People don't realize how quickly it, it literally is overnight. And so it's, you know, the old expression, it's an escalator on the way up. It's an elevator on the way down. And so if you look at like the dot com crash where you had what is it, Black Monday or whatever, like this just like boom, 50 percent drop in the dot coms. And then there was a slow side over the next year, like another 90 percent decrease. But the important thing is as soon as the market had that massive correction, everyone just tightens up and the term sheets just stop going out and rounds that aren't closed yet don't close. We saw this in 2008, uh, you, know, the, you know, the whole rest in peace, good times. Now, that didn't last that long. That only lasted for, I don't know, like what, six, six months to a six year. Months, yeah. yeah, it wasn't it wasn't like full nuclear winter the way that like 2000 to 2002 was. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more like a six to 12 month period. You could still raise, but valuations came down. And we saw this actually during COVID. Um, I think, you know, it, there's a micro vintage in, I'd say April to July, roughly, um, of 2020, like call it like the COVID micro vintage where the NASDAQ was down. Was it like 30, 40, 50%, something like that. And mm-hmm. VCs just tightened up. I mean, they, just stopped issuing term sheets because they're, they were taking a wait and see, which is what happens. I mean, everyone ultimately takes their cues from the public markets. And so, you know, when all of a sudden you have a market crash like that, the term sheets just stop. And now in that case, what happened is the market rebounded. So then the, you know, that, that, then that unfroze the VC market. And in fact, I think in late 2020, VCs were like, oh, that was all like a big nothing. I now I haven't done a deal in six months. And they actually felt like they were making up for lost time. Mm-hmm. And so late 2020, early 2021, it was super frothy. Um, you know, again, that making up for lost time dynamic. And then, of course, you had these the, the late stage private equity money started coming in in a big way with Tiger. Uh, I mean, Tiger is the, the main effect, I would say. And then now there's all these like private equity competitors of Tiger who are looking at what they're doing and going, oh, well, we can do that too. And so now they're coming in. And so you're seeing this explosion of you know, non-traditional VC money coming into the market, which has been absolutely phenomenal for like, again, for fund one for, and our fund two, like a lot of it is driving rapid, huge markups in our portfolio um, as these late stage guys are trying to come in and do growth rounds on our early, you know, on rounds that we led the Cedar Series A. Um, it, I think for, for our fund three, which is happening now, I think it does, it has created a rise in, in valuation levels. Everybody sees that. And so, you know, our entry prices, you know, for fund three are just going to be higher, you know, um, and that, you know, we'll, we'll have to see if that affects the returns or not. That's what we don't know. Yeah. At 56, I just, I remember doing one on two, you know, with pink, like, you know, back in the day, you know, and that's, you know, forgetting what they were in 99, I don't remember, but post bubble and beginning a web 2.0. And, you know, my memory is you could still make money as a founder if you gave up one on two in a seed round. So I think, I think we've swung the pendulum way too far. But again, I don't know, in a world that's printing money and, and uh, with the amount of money already in the system, uh, it sounds like you don't think about it too much. You're just, you're just going. Well, I, I think about it, but, and I think there's two possible interpretations of it. I, there's sort of, there's the, the rational interpretation, then there's the irrational one. I mean, so sort of the, everything is rational interpretation is that Tiger, it, they're really smart guys. And they looked at the public market comps for SaaS companies after the IPO. And they realized that, whoa, I mean, like if we compare the public valuations with their last private round, which happened one year before, People are making three, five, ten x their money, taking like no risk because they've got a liquidation preference, so they're downside protected. So why don't we get into that game? And so then they drive up the price of the last private round. Then they look at the second to last private round, and they're like, "Well, wait a second. The guys who invested before us just made 
five X on our markup in one year. Why don't we start doing that? And so they've kind of gone all the way down the stack. I'd say they're, they're even starting to do some Series A's, and um, and they're basically just you know, on the thesis that everything's you know undervalued. And so and and I think they're really smart guys, and I think there is something to that. And if you're bullish about SaaS the way that we are in business software, it's actually pretty rational. The the sort of the irrational view of the world, meaning that what's happening now is is irrational would be the again like what you said the money printing that there's this tremendous amount of liquidity in the mm-hmm. system that the fed has been pumping the qe the 6 trillion of whatever last year the covid stimulus stuff yeah, last year 9 trillion on yeah. 9 trillion plus now uh the spending is just continuing where You've got, um, what is it? I mean, we already had 1.9 trillion of more COVID stimulus from the new administration. Plus, they're going to pass a 1.2 trillion infrastructure. Plus, now it looks like the, the, the social welfare bill, which, you know, Biden and the, the press has wanted three and a half billion. And now he's signaling more like 1.9 to 2.2 billion. Mansion saying one and a half, whatever. Or so, you're probably going to get like another two trillion there. So you're talking about so two trillion plus the one point two for infrastructure plus the one point nine has already happened. Plus the U.S. government was already like this. Our our budget was in massive deficit. So you've got this, and, and I know people will say, "Oh, you know, Sachs, you're the the two trillion in social welfare is over ten years." Okay, fine. So I get it, but you still are. You have this massive deficit spending. We have twenty eight trillion now in government debt. It's something like, uh, I mean, it's well over 100% now of GDP. And we've never had, we've never run peacetime deficits and debt like this. And we've also never run deficits like this in a good economy. It's a good economy, I mean, it's, correct. It, it, it's one thing to do it when you're in a recession, right? And you're trying to prevent a depression. Like I think, you know, Obama's stimulus bill in 2008, I think that was like reasonable. Um, by the way, like those numbers were quaint by comparison. It was like, I remember, was, remember it, they were like, it was like it, they were yelling at each other and breaking up meetings. And now that's yeah, just like a rounding error. Yeah. It was like 900 billion because they didn't want it to cross over into a trillion. And, um, and you know, in, in, in the wake of, of the biggest financial crisis that we had had and that could have gone into a great depression territory if they hadn't got it under control, I think, you know, breaking the glass in case of emergency, like using fiscal stimulus, using monetary stimulus, pulling out all the stops. I think that made sense. But now, like, what is the justification for this emergency level of spending? Um, so I just, you know, I think there is a lot of risk built into the, the macro picture here. I mean, we haven't even gotten to what's happening in China with, you know, they've got a, de- a looming debt crisis over there with Evergrande. You've got, um, international tension. You've got the issue of Taiwan. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be a trigger for a correction. And, um, you know, it's a little scary. So I could see something coming out of nowhere that all of a sudden creates some horrible correction, but I could also, and, and a lot of companies will be caught, you know, the, the, the tide will go out and a lot of people will be caught swimming naked. Um, and so I can totally see that scenario, but I could also see a scenario where the good times just keep rolling for another couple of years. And so for you, you're just not trying to time. You find great, found, like I say, if four founders mark in the room and they're all great, I don't worry about when I wrote the last check. You know, I tried. Yeah, keep- I think, yeah, it's, especially because, especially because we have a focus on SaaS companies and marketplaces, right? And mm-hmm. we've got a specific thesis around that and we know what we're looking for and we know what a good SaaS company looks like even, you know, in the first year, even when, they only have half a million of ARR. So, you know, in the same way that a founder is primarily concerned with what's happening in their business, not what's happening in the world. I mean, we, we understand SaaS companies. We're primarily concerned with what a good SaaS business is. Now, what we get affected by is price levels, right? So um, my view towards valuations is that as a VC, I, you know, we try to get the best deal we can, but I don't try to, you know, win on valuation. I, I sort of feel like, what we try to win is by being in the companies we want to be in and we pay the prevailing valuations. And it just needs to be sort of fair given what, given everything that's happening, given where the prevailing valuation levels are. Um, 
you can't you can't win deals by trying to be a value investor in VC. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So let's quickly talk about a few names in the portfolio that I that I'm seeing a lot in 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 what they do. ClickUp. I'm seeing the ads everywhere. So so when did you get involved and what do you like about it and how is it working? Yeah, I mean, so ClickUp is an incredible company. It's in the sort of project management space, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's in so it's in the same space as Asana and Monday, which you know are now public and you know fifteen to twenty billion dollar companies. But ClickUp is growing much faster than those companies, and it's growing faster than those companies were growing at a similar point in their development. And um, and the way they've been able to differentiate is just the the comprehensiveness and customizability of the of the functionality. They're trying to be the all-in-one app for everything related to not just project management, but just sort of your, I guess, for company collaboration. And um, and it, it, like I said, it's highly customizable. Um, companies love the product. The way, the way that we found out about it is that we had portfolio companies who were using it and raving about it. And like it, it was happening over like several months, we kept getting these signals. And so we just kept reaching out to the company. And then one day it was actually Brian Rosenblatt, who, you know, um, he got on the phone with Zeb and um, it took a couple of tries. The first conversation, Zeb wasn't fundraising. The second conversation, Zeb was like, yeah, we're thinking about maybe raising some money now. And, um, and so he's like, great, let's, let's get on the phone with David. And, you know, I talked to him about my background, you know, pioneering bottom up SaaS with, with Yammer and we hit it off and we ended up leading their series A. And that was that was actually one of those COVID deals. I mean, this happened in I think April or May of 2020, and now there's a. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to blow yeah, the yeah, future yeah. press announcement, but um, it's going but well. That, yeah, I mean, it's it's a multi unicorn. And so Scratchpad, tell me a little bit about that one. Yeah, Scratchpad. I think it's a it's a great SaaS deal. Um, we did this one I think uh, late last year. And it was sort of a, a preemptive deal. Again, bottom-up SaaS, the product is for salespeople and really anyone in a revenue-producing function. We all know like how bad the UI is in Salesforce, right? And so you know, this started as almost like a UI layer on top of Salesforce where you can see all of your deals. You can quickly input next steps. You can take notes in it. You know, It's almost like a vertical uh, notion or something, a vertical note-taking app that integrates all of your data from Salesforce and it's a two-way sync. So when you update your scratch pad, it'll also update your records in Salesforce. So AEs love it and their managers love it because it keeps they're much more likely to keep their data up to date in Salesforce if they're using this product. So it's really starting to take off now. Um, we, you know, as a preemptive Series A for us, we went in a little bit early, um, you know, given the level of ARR they had at the time and then we helped them recruit a new VP of sales and or not a new one, their first VP of sales. And um, it's just like firing on all cylinders now. And uh, I think it's going to be huge. Now you write. So when did you start and how important is it to you? You know, I write every day. Um, mm-hmm. You write more essay like type stuff. You love Twitter. What, what is it about writing and how important is it? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's a love hate relationship because it is hard for me to sit down and spend you know ten hours or twenty hours or whatever writing like a long thought piece, whether it's business or politics or whatever. Uh, but I know it's something I should do, and uh, but it's hard with all the the stimulation you get from the world throwing things at you. Uh, it's a lot easier to tweet, let's put it that way. So, yeah. um, but it, but it is something that I thought was important to do. So I, I created a Substack and. Um, my, my goal was just to get out everything I had learned about SaaS and really bottom up SaaS before, while I was still fresh in my mind as a practitioner, as an operator, you know, trying to get all that in writing. And it, the, the blog is very much stimulated, I would say, by my conversations with founders. You know, when, you know, by the time the fifth founder asked me, hey, how should I structure my sales team? I'm like, you know what? Instead of me having this conversation again, let me just write up this blog post you know, that's how a lot of these blogs are born. Or, um, you know, if there's a there's a blog post, uh, a sub stack I wrote called Simple Math to Structure a Sales Team. It's like, you know, when I was at Yammer, I figured out there was all these like simple mathematical relationships um, in terms of 
how I ended up structuring the sales team. And I don't know why no one had really pointed this stuff out before, but so I, I wrote, I wrote an article about that. And, um, similarly with the operating philosophy I used at PayPal and that at Yammer to keep, you know, a 500 person army coordinated. How do you do that? That was one of the questions that founders would always come to me asking about is, well, you know, they, they would usually frame it as like, Hey, I need a COO because the company's coming apart at the seams. What do I do? And so I wrote the cadence. So yeah, I mean, all the, the blog posts come out of my conversations with the founders combined with my experience, you know, when, when I was a founder and an operator of these companies. No, they're great. So, so quick question. So you can't eat to relax anymore. Um, <laughs> so what do you do to relax? I mean, obviously you got kids and you got a wife. So what do, is, is it movies? Is it do you, like, what is your thing? Yeah. You know, um, I try to obviously try to do the family stuff, the stuff with the kids. Um, you know, I, I don't watch that much conventional TV anymore. I mean, I guess I am watching, uh, was it Squid Game or whatever? I'm mm-hmm. in the middle of that. I'm giving it a second chance because I, I watched like an episode. I'm like, why did I just waste time? I knew there was a hook, but I, it didn't hit me. And now the hook is I'm hearing about it everywhere. And I'm, I haven't gone back to start again, but I just thought, oh, they put me I'm down like, some crappy yeah. rabbit hole and I quit. But now I feel I have to go back. Yeah, I'm like halfway through it and I think it's really good. Um, to be honest, I watch, I watch a lot of YouTube. I watch like a lot of just random channels. Um, I watch a lot of like chess channels. Huh. Um, I somehow find that relaxing. Um, there's a, uh, there's a channel, a guy named Agad Mater, who I think is in Slovakia or something like that. Um, and there's a guy in the UK named Daniel King. Anyway, I, I watch those two chess channels and, um, and what they do is they cover, like what's happening in the professional chess world. So, you know, if you're a fan of like tennis or golf or whatever, you'd be watching those matches with chess. It's a little different because, you know, a chess game could take six hours. You're not going to sit there watching it for six hours. So what, what one of these guys will do is they will replay the game to you in like 15 minutes explaining much like Google What's does happening? with sports. They just give you those two minute wraps, which has me hooked. Yeah, exactly. I don't have to watch the game. So you have a good sense of humor. Where'd that come from? <laughs> you know, when I, uh, when I was a kid, I loved stand up comedy. Um, I, I like comedies, classic comedies, those movies. Um, you know, I was into the Ivan Reitman movies when I was a kid. Um, Where'd you Caddyshack, grow up? All that kind of well, my parents were from South Africa and we immigrated to the United oh, I didn't States. Know when that. I was, yeah. When, when I was five, we, we moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and then I came out to California for classic for Jew and, migration through Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, exactly. they, that's where they drop everybody off. Yeah. I did stand up as a kid and, uh, but I can, I can see it. Like all the guys on your pod seem to mm-hmm. be funny except for Friedberg and Jason. So half, half of you are funny. <laughs> <laughs> Friedberg, well, Jay, I know Jay, must be yeah. funny. Like I'm just, he has the ability to i'm not into biotech but he, he literally he literally speaks english around a subject i didn't fully understand he's like kind of he's cool and um it's quite an interesting group of people are you enjoying doing it yeah yeah i guess yeah i am um it's been a fun thing to do i guess we've been doing it now for well actually episode number 50 is coming up it's been over a year you know we started doing it during covid everyone was locked in their houses the way Chamath puts it is that um, it was like the only way to see our friends. You know, it's like we did it to keep each other sane. And uh, so, yeah, and then it's been totally unexpected the response it's gotten. I mean, I didn't expect that so many people, w- I mean, everywhere I go now, people like come out of the woodwork and tell me they love the pod. And people tell me they secretly like my hot takes. I can't say it publicly, but privately they tell Why me Why can't that. you say it? I, Canoe and I are in Phoenix. I grew up, you know, I grew up in Toronto. I'm a Phoenix boy, so I'm I'm pretty right wing. And I grew up as a Jew in Toronto, so it's like hearing the Israeli air, you know, hijackings and Tebby, and and I'm pretty eye for an eye guy. And then I come to Phoenix, so I, I consider myself pretty damn conservative. But I didn't become political until Trump became president because I didn't consider him any. I didn't even know what he was. And now I'm like back to being indifferent, which is probably bad, but like, I'm just happy not to have to think about it. So when did you become like into politics? Well, I, the, the pod really is the thing that forced me to have to take, I mean, if you're going to do a weekly pod, you have to basically give your takes, right? And Mm -hmm. what am I going to do? Just go on there and kind of like have this 
internal filter and not say what I think about stuff. There's just no way to do that. So I started giving these takes and then, you know, uh, one of our, one of our fans <laughs> named uh, Henry Belcaster started creating clips of them. And then, you know, initially I was giving these hot takes on the pod, but I was just keeping my Twitter feed all business. I mean, I didn't used to tweet about go back two years. I never tweeted about politics. Cause I'm like, Oh God, political Twitter is just such a cesspool, right? It's yeah. just a, it's just total division and hatred or whatever. And also I didn't really want to alienate. I mean, I know that no, you're going to alienate half the country if you take a stance on anything political, Correct. you know, it's a, it's a shame that that's the case, but so I wasn't trying to be political, but the pod sort of forced me into this corner where, you know, I just was giving my takes on the pod and then Belcaster started creating these videos. And so then I'm like, shit, now I got to defend what I'm saying on Twitter. Cause I, you know, I was trying to have like a separation where I was keeping Twitter for business, but then we have these like Belcasters now. So, um, yeah, I mean, it kind of forced me to get political. And then, you know, the other thing that happened over the last, well, really this year, over the last year is, I mean, one of the main issues I really care about is is free speech. And free speech has really come under assault from my from my standpoint. Uh, you had, you know, it, and it really, it, it started before the deplatforming of Trump, but that was definitely a major milestone that a sitting president of the United States could be thrown off social media and deplatformed. And since then, it's, you know, there's been, you know, many, many more people who've been deplatformed. YouTube just deleted a million videos from its platform because they disagreed with official opinion on COVID, which, you know, is just unbelievable to me that this type of censorship could be taking place. We've come way down the slippery slope. So that's an issue that really has been important to me. And, you know, you use the, the label right wing. I, I don't really know what that means anymore because either do I, I throw it out there because yeah. it doesn't mean anything. Well, I just, you know, I, like I'm a guy who's always been socially pretty tolerant and, and liberal. I mean, I'm in favor of everything, you know, all the traditional social issues. I'm on the, let's call it the, the choice side, the personal freedom side, whether it's gay marriage or what have you. Um, internationally, I'm against like all these crazy interventionist wars we've been fighting. So I'm not like somebody who wants to go marching around the world imposing American imperialism. So what is exactly does it mean to, I mean, I do think I'm, I would like the country to be fiscally responsible and not, you know, not have gigantic deficits and debt, but I don't know. What do you, what do you call somebody who is socially tolerant, internationally cautious, fiscally responsible and believes in free speech? I mean, is that, is that right wing now? No, or you're Chinese. The- <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it works on Twitter. I was just reading some of the tweets, and I'm like, mm-hmm. now that I can hear your point of view, I feel I agree with you most of the time. I don't need to know David Sachs' stances on everything. You know, I'm an investor. Right. Uh, you have great common sense. You have great instincts. You've been around really smart people. You know, my podcast is about just trying to get closer to that and, and, and help the people that follow me. So politics is a, is, is a no-win game. I get the hot takes. Right. That's why I like your hot takes because they're kind of I kind of agree with a lot of your hot takes because you know if you, if you get asked a question in a format like a podcast, you can do it. But once you write it down, I don't know how you win. Yeah, you're right. I mean, because I agree it, with you on everything yeah. about the government and Facebook. But once you put it in a tweet, you just you're pigeonholed. Whereas on a podcast, there's a little more context and whatever. So I think I've really enjoyed the hot takes coming out of your mouth, not through your fingers. <laughs> So hopefully we can work on a deal. I really appreciate uh, your time. I'll have to have you back on to, to talk investing again, but uh, congratulations on a great career of investing. I mean, motivation wise, what keeps you motivated? Well, I still really enjoy building products. And so, you know, I've really enjoyed the process with call in. I mean, every couple of years I get to incubate something and that's mm-hmm. really fun for me. I don't, necessarily want to do the day-to-day work. And so I'm fortunate to have like co-founders in those ventures where they're kind of running the day-to-day stuff. But I, but I do enjoy getting to work on the product and the strategy. And then, you know, dittos for working with founders and, um, you know, giving them advice. It's, I mean, I feel like I'm in a highly leveraged spot to add value because I don't have to run the day-to-day of anything, which, you know, you get to a certain point and you've just, it kind of gets old. But, you know, once 
every couple of months I can meet with the founder and they can tell me what's on their mind and I can give them advice. And, you know, I enjoy doing that. Yeah, there's ne- everybody, you said there's never been a better time to be an investor or a founder. There's never been a better time to be passionate about something. And, you know, it's part of our job is to is kind of steer kids. Like you almost went down this path of consulting, like fucking in the 90s. If you were an entrepreneur in Toronto, you had a deli or a furrier. That was what an entrepreneur was, right? Like there was no <laughs> scale. There was right. like a store. And it was, this is all new, right? Like you were, you were like, you know, the immigrant Jewish person. And your parents were probably super proud that you went to law school and were going to be at McKinsey. Right? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, they right. never wanted, like, when, I, when I quit McKinsey to Ethel go join Sachs PayPal, or whatever was, your mom's name was, God bless. <laughs> it's like, fuck you, David. Do you know what your dad did to get you out of South Africa through Memphis so that you could go to McKinsey and now you're throwing it all away? I can see. I can hear her. Yeah. There's a lot of Jewish mother panic in that decision. Oh, my God. You're, you're quitting your job and you know, you're joining a startup and that whole thing. So, yeah, 100%. Um, but, and, and this is the thing is that founders don't realize like how good they have it today. They don't, they don't. I mean, it's so much easier to every aspect of doing something entrepreneurial is so much easier. I mean, whether it's getting the money or the know-how or the supporters or, or just, you know, even the, again, the social acceptance of quitting whatever big company job you're doing to go off on your own. I mean, like now it's almost like a track. I mean, um, no, it's like LinkedIn. I tell my nephews, you just right. go put in the time, take the low pay, go work at an enterprise company that gives you the tools in a year, let LinkedIn do its work after that. You go make your money in two, three years. That's the new track. If you right. can't code, put yourself into the system in the enterprise world and then let LinkedIn find you the next great company after you've go learn all your lessons at a great company that has all the tools to teach you how to sell. And right. it's just never been a better time to put yourself into that machine or into that feed or into that system. But I think what you're saying is correct. Every kid needs to go read Phil Knight. It's not that old company to go see what the fuck that guy had to do to build that company 10 years to get to 10 million in mm-hmm. revenue and flying to Asia and building warehouses and doing all that stuff himself. I don't think entrepreneurs right. really realize that was an entrepreneur, you know? Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, VC, I think, has become the greatest engine for creating opportunity that the world, I think, has ever seen. I mean, because anybody who has a good idea now can go get some funding to pursue it and get rich. It's, I mean, it's really unbelievable. Like, uh, young people don't understand that money generally wasn't that available. It was scarce. yeah, it's even tw- even thirty years ago, I mean, and and the and the investors, like going back to the nineteen nineties, would generally have the leverage, and if your company did well, would replace you. Now, the founders, no matter how inexperienced they are, have all the leverage, and any not just good idea, but any plausible idea, or even semi plausible idea, will get money thrown at it by any number of VCs. And now there's like micro VCs and seed VCs and. So it's just never been easier to experiment and try something and get something off the ground. And of course, you never hear about the opportunity and prosperity that VC is creating. It's this constant demonization in the media of, you know, of how um, exclusive or discriminatory or whatever that the VC industry is. And it's like, I don't think these people get it. I mean, we're in the underdog business. I mean, we are giving checks to people with no money, no power, no connections, no nothing uh, except a good idea. You know, that is a huge creator of opportunity. And of course, you never hear anything about that. Well, you're not going to hear about it, but what we have created it through this printing of money and whatever the economy and whatever prosperity we've had is an investing class. So our kids are going to have a lot different path. Uh, the world's not going to go. There is no back B to B. There's no back to banking, and there's not. There's no back to what was back to C. Back to consulting. Back, back to consulting. consulting. <laughs> that world is over. I don't know what the new B to B means and the new B to C. So that's for us to come up with something. I'm trying to think. But it's going to be back to crypto. Like it's so good, you got to go back to crypto. Uh, and I don't know what B to B is. I, I, I guess the back to would be people going back to Google or back to Facebook or whatever. Yeah, B to like G or B to F. Yeah. But yeah, there right. is no more uh, back to to banking. So it is a great time. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, continue the hot takes. I think your hot take here is that it's never been a better time 
to just doing what you love, investing, uh, your passion, and or starting a company. And we'll leave it there. Thanks, David, for your time. And hopefully we'll get you back soon. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Thanks, Howard. So there it is, man. There's so much you can talk about. We still don't even really dig in. So I appreciate everybody for tuning in and forcing me to get Dave. I'm glad I just pinged him and set that up. But like, he's, you know, look at that. He won't stop. And, and it's funny that if you let people do hot takes, they'll, they'll, they can throw themselves over a, over a bridge. But he's not scared. Eh? He's no, not, not scared at all. of uh, telling you. Can you imagine being in a room with Musk, Peter Thiel, Max Lechman, and I don't know, the few others that were no, just insane. <laughs> and kind of like doing this stuff at PayPal. Right. right? It's just fascinating. That yeah. wasn't that long ago. And so he's kind of ground zero of all that happening. Fantastic. And if it wasn't for the phone call for Peter Thiel, from Peter Thiel, um, I have a great Peter Thiel call story as well. But we'll do it another time. Thanks, everybody. It's Panic with Friends. We talk to investors uh, like David Sachs, also an operator, traders, entrepreneurs. And we're trying to get a little bit of step into the future and find out where the trends are. Uh, hope you like it. You can search my name, Howard Lindsay, Spotify, Apple, Google, have a YouTube channel once a week, get an alert. Uh, thanks, Knut. Thanks, uh, StockTwitch, for uh, promoting. And we'll see everybody next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or Stock Twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. So hopefully we can work on a deal. I really appreciate uh, your time. I'll have to have you back on to, to talk investing again, but uh, congratulations on a great career of investing. I mean, motivation wise, what keeps you motivated? Well, I still really enjoy building products. And so, you know, I've really enjoyed the process with call in. I mean, every couple of years I get to incubate something and that's mm -hmm. really fun for me. I don't, necessarily want to do the day-to-day -day work. And so I'm fortunate to have like co-founders in those ventures where they're kind of running the day-to-day -day stuff. But I, but I do enjoy getting to work on the product and the strategy. And then, you know, dittos for working with founders and, um, you know, giving them advice. It's, I mean, I feel like I'm in a highly leveraged spot to add value because I don't have to run the day-to-day -day of anything, which, you know, you get to a certain point, you've just, just kind of gets old. But, you know, once every couple of months I can meet with the founder and they can tell me what's on their mind and I can give them advice. And, you know, I enjoy doing that. Yeah, there's ne everybody you said there's never been a better time to be an investor or a founder. There's never been a better time to be passionate about something. And, you know, it's part of our job is to is kind of steer kids like you almost went down this path of consulting like fucking in the 90s. If you were an entrepreneur in Toronto, you had a deli or a furrier. That was what an entrepreneur was, right? Like there was no <laughs> scale. There was right. like a store. And it was, this is all new, right? Like you were, you were like, you know, the immigrant Jewish person. And your parents were probably super proud that you went to law school and were going to be at McKinsey. Right? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, they right. never wanted, like, when, I, when I quit McKinsey to Ethel go join Ethel Sachs or whatever was... your mom's name was, God bless. It's was like, <laughs> fuck you, David. Do you know what your dad did to get you out of South Africa through Memphis so that you could go to McKinsey and now you're throwing it all away? I can see, I can hear her. Yeah, there's a lot of Jewish mother panic in that decision. Oh my God, you're, you're quitting your job and you know, you're joining a startup and that whole thing. So yeah, 100%. Um, but, and, and this is the thing is that founders don't realize like how good they have it today. They don't. They don't. I mean, it's so much easier to every aspect of doing something entrepreneurial is so much easier. I mean, whether it's getting the money or the know-how or the supporters or, or just, you know, even the, again, the social acceptance of quitting whatever big company job you're doing to go off on your own. I mean, like now it's almost like a track. I mean, um, no, it's like LinkedIn. I tell my nephews, you just right. go put in the time take the low pay, go work at an enterprise company that gives you the tools in a year, let LinkedIn do its work after that. You go make your money in two, three years. That's the new track. If you right. can't code, 
put yourself into the system in the enterprise world and then let LinkedIn find you the next great company after you've go learn all your lessons at a great company that has all the tools to teach you how to sell. And right. it's just never been a better time to put yourself into that machine or into that feed or into that system. But I think what you're saying is correct. Every kid needs to go read Phil Knight. It's not that old company to go see what the fuck that guy had to do to build that company 10 years to get to 10 million in mm -hmm. revenue and flying to Asia and building warehouses and doing all that stuff himself. I don't think entrepreneurs right. really realize that was an entrepreneur, you know? Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, VC, I think, has become the greatest engine for creating opportunity that the world, I think, has ever seen. I mean, because anybody who has a good idea now can go get some funding to pursue it and get rich. It's, I mean, it's really unbelievable. Like, the, uh, young people don't understand that money generally wasn't that available. It was even, scarce. Yeah, it was even, scarce. even 30 years ago. I mean, and, and, the, and the investors, like going back to the 1990s, would generally have the leverage. And if your company did well, would replace you. Now, the founders, no matter how inexperienced they are, have all the leverage. And any, not just good idea, but any plausible idea, or even semi-plausible idea, will get money thrown at it by any number of VCs. And now there's like micro VCs and seed VCs. And so it's just never been easier to experiment and try something and get something off the ground. And of course, you never hear about the opportunity and prosperity that VC is creating. It's this constant demonization in the media of, you know, of how um, exclusive or discriminatory or whatever that the VC industry is. And it's like, I don't think these people get it. I mean, we're in the underdog business. I mean, we are giving checks to people with no money, no power, no connections, no nothing, uh, except a good idea. You know, that is a huge creator of opportunity. And of course, you never hear anything about that. Well, you're not going to hear about it, but what we have created it through this printing of money and whatever the economy and whatever prosperity we've had is an investing class. So our kids are going to have a lot different path. Uh, the world's not going to go, there is no back B2B, there's no back to banking and not, there's no back to, what was back to C? Back to consulting. Back, back to consulting. consulting. <laughs> that world is over. I don't know what the new B2B means and the new B2C, so that's for us to come up with something. I'm trying to think, but it's going to be back to crypto. Like, it's so good, you got to go back to crypto. Uh, and I don't know what or B2B is. I, I, I guess the back to would be people going back to Google or back to Facebook or whatever. Yeah, B2G like or B2F. Yeah, but yeah, there right. is no more uh, back to, to banking. So it is a great time. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, continue the hot takes. I think your hot take here is that it's never been a better time to just doing what you love, investing, uh, your passion, and or starting a company. And we'll leave it there. Thanks, David, for your time. And hopefully we'll get you back soon. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Thanks, Howard. So there it is, man. There's so much you can talk about. And we still don't even really dig in. So I appreciate everybody for tuning in and forcing me to get Dave. I'm glad I just pinged him and set that up. But like, he's, you know, look at that. He won't stop. And, and it's funny that if you let people do hot takes, they'll, they'll, they can throw themselves over a, over a bridge. But he's not scared. Eh? He's no, not, not scared of uh, telling you. Can you imagine being in a room with Musk, Peter Thiel, Max Lechman, and I don't know, the few others that were no, just insane. <laughs> and kind of like doing this stuff at PayPal. Right. And it's just fascinating. That yeah. wasn't that long ago. And so he's kind of ground zero of all that happening. Fantastic. And if it wasn't for the phone call for Peter Thiel, from Peter Thiel, um, I have a great Peter Thiel call story as well. But we'll do it another time. Thanks, everybody. It's Panic with Friends. We talk to investors uh, like David Sachs, also an operator, traders, entrepreneurs. And we're trying to get a little bit of step into the future and find out where the trends are. Uh, hope you like it. You can search my name, Howard Lindsay, Spotify, Apple, Google, have a YouTube channel once a week, get an alert. Uh, thanks, Knut. Thanks, uh, StockTwits, for uh, promoting. And we'll see everybody next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or Stock Twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. 
Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Uh, hope you like it. You can search my name, Howard Lindsay, Spotify, Apple, Google, have a YouTube channel once a week, get an alert. Uh, thanks, Knut. Thanks, uh, StockTwits, for uh, promoting, and we'll see everybody next week. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Positions and securities discussed in this podcast.